Hello to chapter 79 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. And this chapter is titled The Prairie. To scan the lines of his face or feel the bumps on the head of this leviathan, this is a thing which no physiognomist or phrenologist has as yet undertaken. Such an enterprise would seem almost as hopeful as for Lavata to have scrutinized the wrinkles on the rock of Gibraltar, or for Gaul to have mounted a ladder and manipulated the dome of the Pantheon. Still, in that famous work of his, Lavata not only treats of the various faces of men, but also attentively studies the faces of horses, birds, serpents, and fish, and dwells in detail upon the modifications of expression discernible therein. Nor have Gull and his disciple Spurzheim failed to throw out some hints touching the phrenological characteristics of other beings than man. Therefore, though I am but ill-qualified for a pioneer in the application of these two semi-sciences to the whale, I will do my endeavor. I try all things. I achieve what I can. Physiognomically regarded, the sperm whale is an anomalous creature. He has no proper nose. And since the nose is the central and most conspicuous of the features, and since it perhaps most modifies and finally controls their combined expression, hence it would seem that its entire absence as an external appendage must very largely affect the countenance of the whale. For, as in landscape gardening, a spire, copula, monument or tower of some sort is deemed almost indispensable to the completion of the scene, so no face can be physiognomically in keeping without the elevated, open-work belfry of the nose. Dash the nose from Phidias, Marble, Jove, and what a sorry remainder. Nevertheless, Leviathan is of so mighty a magnitude, all his proportions are so stately, that the same deficiency which is in the sculptured Jove were hideous. In him is no blemish at all. Nay, it is an added grandeur. A nose to the whale would have been impertinent. As on your physiognomical voyage you sail round his vast head in your jolly boat, your noble conceptions of him are never insulted by the reflection that he has a nose to be pulled. A pestilent conceit which so often will insist upon obtruding even when beholding the mightiest royal beadle on his throne. In some particulars, perhaps the most imposing physiognomical view to be had of the sperm whale in, is that of the full front of his head. This aspect is sublime. In thought, a fine human brow is like the east when troubled with the morning. In the repose of the pasture, the curled brow of the bull has a touch of the grand in it. Pushing heavy cannon up mountain defiles, the elephant's brow is majestic. Human or animal, the mystical brow is as that great golden seal affixed by the German emperors to their decrees. It signifies, God, done this day by my hand. But in most creatures, nay, in man himself, very often the brow is but a mere strip of alpine land laying along the snow line. Few are the foreheads which, like Shakespeare's or Melanchthon's, rise so high and descend so low that the eyes themselves seem clear, eternal, tideless mountain lakes, and all above them, in the foreheads' wrinkles, you seem to track 
the antlered thoughts descending there to drink as the highland hunters track the snow prints of the deer. But in the great sperm whale, this high and mighty godlike dignity inherent in the brow is so immensely amplified that gazing on it, in that full front view, you feel the deity and the dread powers more forcibly than in holding any other object in living nature. For you see no one point precisely. Not one distinct feature is revealed. No nose, eyes, ears or mouth. No face. He has none. Proper. Nothing but that one broad firmament of a forehead pleated with riddles dumbly lowering with the doom of boats and ships and man, nor, in profile, does this wondrous brow diminish, though that way viewed its grandeur does not domineer upon you so. In profile, you plainly perceive that horizontal, semi-crescentic depression in the forehead's middle, which, in a man, is Lavata's mark of genius. But how? Genius? In the sperm whale? Has the sperm whale ever written a book, spoken a speech? No. His great genius is declared in doing nothing particular to prove it. It is moreover declared in his particular pyramidical silence. And this reminds me that had the great sperm whale been known to the young Orient world, he would have been deified in their child Magian thoughts. They deified the crocodile of the Nile because the crocodile is tongueless and the sperm whale has no tongue, or at least it is so exceedingly small as to be incapable of protrusion. If hereafter any highly cultured poetical nation shall lure back to their birthright the merry May Day gods of old and livingly enthrone them again in the now egotistical sky, in the now unhaunted hill, then be sure, exalted to Jove's high seat, the great sperm whale shall lord it. Champollion deciphered the wrinkled granite hieroglyphics. But there is no Champollion to, the, to decipher the Egypt of every man's and every being's face. Physiognomy, like every other human science, is but a passing fable. If then Sir William Jones, who read in thirty languages, could not read the simplest peasant's face in its profounder and more subtle meanings, how may unlettered Ishmael hope to read the awful Chaldee of the sperm whale's brow, I but put that brow before you. Read it, if you can. So, that was chapter 79. Bye-bye till next time with chapter 80, titled The Nut.